So I just mentioned the couple of mission trips that uh, Champion Force people are out on right now or the past couple of weeks, and, and I've been blessed to go on several of those over the years as well. One of my favorites that I've gotten to be a part of is this partnership that we have uh, with some, some believers and churches in the Northeast of England. It, it's a great place to go. There's some incredible people, and we've had this back and forth partnership there, and, and a big part of our ministry has been in schools there, and because of that, our students going on that trip has been vital to the partnership. And uh, every trip, it was funny to hear the students talking about words in England that meant something different here than the words in the U.S. Now you'd think, okay, we speak English here, they speak English there, this is simple, there should be very little miscommunication, but that's not always the case. Our kids would stay in host homes there, and on one of our first trips, you know, we corrected this, so it didn't happen after this, but one of the first trips we were there, uh, our kids came back to the school after spending the night in the host home, and they said, man, you gotta go get me some food. We're starving right now. It's like, what do you mean? They didn't feed you dinner? And he goes, no, they didn't feed us dinner in our house last night. And that's unusual, right? A lot of times these host homes would go above and beyond to make a good impression, to make it a fun experience for for the students, and so I started asking questions, and as I asked questions, I realized, okay, they did offer you dinner, but, but you, you didn't know it, and so ultimately, you missed out. The host home asked the kids, hey, would you guys like tea before you go to bed? That means dinner in, in that part of England, right? They said, would you like dinner, but they used the word tea. The kids heard the word tea, and what did they think? And they thought the drink. And they thought, no, we, we don't want any tea. And their minds are probably thinking, we really love some dinner right now, though. Uh, but the kids were sent to bed that night without their dinner. They turned it down. Why? But they didn't understand the word. They didn't make that mistake again, by the way. They ate the rest of their trip. But they misunderstood a very common word. And because of that, they missed out on something great. I want you to think about that. They misunderstood Common word, word that's used all the time. Because they misunderstood it, they missed out on something great. A lot of us do that with the word church. We say it a lot, it's a common word. Most of us have some kind of idea what we mean when we say it, but too many times in the culture we live in today, the word church is used in sentences that have a different meaning than what we see in the Bible. Right? A lot of people in our world today, when they refer to church, they're referring to a building. They say, let's go to the church, and they're saying the church is, is a building, but I went back and checked. Right? The word for church in the New Testament is ecclesia. It's used 114 times in the New Testament, and every single time the word church is used in the Bible, it refers to people, not bricks. If you're taking notes this morning, you put that at the top of your page, that could be the title of our, our time. It, it, everything's gonna drive through what we see of the church. Right? It's people, not bricks. We wanna make sure that we understand that as we open the Bible this morning because if we don't understand that the church is people, we're gonna miss out on more than just dinner. We're gonna miss out on the relationships that God has called us to live in for very practical and real reasons. We're gonna miss out on these reasons that are ultimately for the glory of God, for the good of every one of us, and ultimately for the joy of every person that's in this room, right? We're looking at the church in scripture today. And this isn't a sermon on like one text where we're gonna drill down on one text and flesh it out. We're not gonna look at Ephesians 4 and talk about how the, we're supposed to equip the church. We're not looking at Matthew 16 where Peter says I'm gonna build it on this rock. Well, we're gonna see some of those as we flesh through scripture today, right? But this is a doctrine series. And our goal in this series is to identify what we believe and why about these critical aspects of our faith. And so our goal this morning, as we look at the word church and the, uh, the command of church in the Bible, is to get a proper view and understanding of what a church is and how you and I are supposed to fit into what God calls his church. Right, we're gonna look at some scriptures to get started. And again, I said it's used 114 times, so we might not look at every scripture this morning. Some of these moms wanna go to lunch, and I get it. All right, we're gonna look at a few as we get started. Ephesians 5, 25 says this. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's people. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, he put all things under his feet and gave him, that's Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church, people, is the body of Christ. 
Matthew 16, the words of Jesus, I tell you, you're Peter on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church wins, right? Acts 14, verse 27 says, when they arrived, they gathered the church together and they declared all that God had done with them and how God had opened the doors of the faith to the Gentiles. The word church, very clearly in these verses and in more, it means people, it means gathering, it means assembly or, or congregation, group of people, but not just any gathering or group of people is considered a church. Or if you were to go down this afternoon to Minute Maid Park with 40,000 of, of your best friends, that, that's a gathering of people, but that is not a church. If you wanted to find a church, We'll see it in scripture. Wayne Grudem gives a great, uh, simple phrase that we can use. Here's a church. A church is the community of all true believers for all time. That's a very simple definition. The church is the community of all true believers for all time. The church is made up of men and women who have been, who are, or whoever will be true believers in Jesus Christ. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verse two, look at what the Bible says. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those that are sanctified in Jesus, that are called to be saints together, with all of those in every place who call upon the name of Jesus, both their Lord and ours. We see here that the church is all believers. We're one body in Christ, many languages, many colors, many cultures, many eras of time all throughout history, but we have a common bond. We are unified in our relationship by our relationship with Jesus Christ as children of God. It's your relationship with him. It's the fact that you have trusted in him as your Lord and Savior that makes you a part of what scripture calls the church. The church is people, not bricks. And as we see that word church used in the New Testament, we see it used or described in a couple of ways. I wanna identify both of these so that we have a proper understanding. We see the church identified as the global church, big C church, all believers around the world of all time, and we see the church identified as local gatherings of believers, like us, we are a local church. When we talk about global church, that's all the believers around the world, not one specific group of relationally connected people. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 1, verse two. It's called all the saints together with those who are in every place that call in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ephesians 5, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, right? That, that is anyone that would believe in him, not one specific regionally connected group of people. Acts 9, it says the church throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria was being built up, right? These references to the church are, are global, all believers, all time around the world. But we also see, and I just mentioned, the church referred to as local gatherings, the local church. We are a local church. Think about that. We're believers in Jesus. We're gathered together we know one another, we're organized, we're, we're in relationships, and we do what the Bible tells us to do, and we're gonna get into that in just a minute. We see that model of the local church in the Bible. Galatians chapter one, verses one and two, right? We see that the Paul of the apostles writing to the churches of Galatia. First Corinthians 16, 19 says, the churches that are in Asia send you their greetings, Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church that meets in their home, they send you a hearty greeting as well local churches. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, of Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, right? These verses show local churches of gathered believers in specific regions of the world. Again, whether we're looking at global church or local church, we see that the church is people, not bricks. It's not a building. And so that brings us to the next question then. Would any gathering of believers be called a church? And I wanna make sure that we understand this so that we're living out scripture the way that God has called us to. There's specific marks of a church that, that most theologians, most scholars would say the Bible gives us, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them. There's two specific marks for a church that, that we need to look at, and, and we look at it, and it's important that we look at this because we need to ensure that we, as a local church, are doing what God has called local churches to do. The first mark of a church is this. A church preaches the word of God. That's it, a church preaches the word of God. You could say it a different way, a church has sound doctrine, 
A church has firm beliefs on the words of Jesus. However you wanna say that, a church preaches the word of God. We see it in Acts 2.42, the very first church as they begin to gather in the book of Acts. So this is a fundamental verse for churches where we still pattern our life and our church after today. It says this, the early believers, the early church, they devoted themselves first to the apostles' teaching. Right, that's the teachings of Jesus. That's the teachings of the scripture. John Calvin said, wherever we see the word of God purely preached, and listen to this, purely preached and heard, and heard. This is a two-way street, right? Both preached and heard. There, it is not to be doubted, a church of God exists. That's what we see in Acts. Right, the church is devoted to the teaching of God's word and to prayer. So, when we gather, just know, in here, we're gonna turn to the Bible. Right? Our goal is not to share man-made ideas. Our goal is, is not to share um, the, the newest or most creative self-help theories of our culture. Our goal is not to share uh, funny stories that make us laugh or feel good or walk out or whatever. Our goal is to preach the word of God. We see that in scripture. In right? Acts 2.42, we also see it in 2 Timothy 4, verses one and two. As Paul writes to a young pastor that is with a group of people, he tells them what to do when the church is gathered together. He says, I charge you, listen to how serious this is. I, I want you to, to catch the gravity of this letter here. I charge you in the presence of God, and I charge you in the presence of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. That's the charge according to God, who's going to judge all people living and dead. Here it is, verse two. Preach the word. That's what churches are called and charged to do. And I wanna pause here real quick because in those three words, preach the word, we see the eternity-changing impact of Timothy's mother. If you know scripture, you know this. Timothy knew the word of God because his mother knew the word of God and taught him the word of God. Timothy's mother knew the word of God because her mother knew the word of God and taught her the word of God. The generational impact and influence of a faithful mother that loves the Lord and ensures their kids do as well. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul writing to Timothy at the very beginning of this letter we just looked at. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and then and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. Listen, Timothy's mom gave him Jesus. Timothy's mom gave him the word of God, taught him the word of God, taught him the faith of God and to love God and completely changed the trajectory of his life. He would not have been who he was without his mother. That's true of you too, right? And that's true of, of me as well. I'm blessed to have a godly mom or who showed me, who taught me the word of God from the time that I was young. She showed me what it looked like to faithfully follow Jesus. I would not be who I am without my mom. My kids are blessed in that same way. And they have a mom that teaches them the word of God. They have a mom that, that prays with them, that shows them what it looks like to follow Jesus by her personal example. They, they see her faithfulness and her love. And so to every mom in here, I just wanna thank you this morning for your investment, in us, your kids, for your sacrifice in us. And I want you to see in scripture the generational impact that you have on the lives of your kids and your grandkids. Many, many of the impacts you will never know this side of eternity, right? Keep going, pointing your kids to Jesus, investing in them now, no matter how old they get. Timothy is charged as a leader in the church to preach the word of God to the church. The word that he first learned from his mother, he's called to preach it. And I want you to see why in the very next verse, verse three, he's told to preach the word as a reminder because there are some gatherings of believers that have drifted from the word of God in this culture, and there are some gatherings of believers in our culture today that have drifted from the teaching of the word of God. Look at what scripture says. It says, for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. A time is coming when people will not endure sound, biblical, right, and true doctrine. It says instead, they're gonna have itching ears and they're gonna find teachers that will tell them what they wanna hear. They're gonna find teachers that'll let them live however they want. It says they're gonna turn away from listening to the truth. They're gonna wander off into myths. 
that he's encouraged to preach the word and to fulfill the ministry. Churches are called to preach the word of God. We are a church and that's what we will do. We will preach the word of God. Back to Acts 2.42, second mark of a church. We see they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, the teaching of the word. We also see they're, they're devoted to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, the second mark of a church is this. It's found in that verse. A church follows the ordinances of Jesus. And I'll explain what I mean. Right? Specifically, I mean the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism. It's right there. Baptism follows the commands of Jesus. Right? Matthew 28, Jesus says, make disciples and baptize them. You saw it this morning. We saw six people baptized in here. And baptism throughout church history and even today, because of the words of Jesus, has been the way that people are identified into the fellowship that is referred to in Acts chapter two, right? They, they, they were identified as followers of Christ because of the public expression of baptism, and that is what welcomed them into the membership or the fellowship of those local churches. And in Acts two, what well, we also see that a church is devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, we break bread in our life group classes often, uh, but I'm not talking about Donuts, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I'm gonna try to go find some in the life groups after service today, I'm sort of hungry. Uh, but the breaking of bread that's mentioned here in Acts 2 is the Lord's Supper. They shared the Lord's Supper together and they did it often. Why? Jesus told them to. Before he went to the cross, he said, do this, share the Lord's Supper and do it often in remembrance of me. Please understand that the words of Jesus drive the life of the church. It's not about our preferences, it's not about our ideas or what we want. The words of Jesus drive what we do as we gather together. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, they show what a church believes about salvation. They show what a church believes about scripture. They show that a church is committed to the words of Jesus and they show that a church is living the biblical model in our culture today. All right, we've got a definition. The church is people, not bricks. People that have trusted in Jesus make up the church. We see that churches, when they gather, they teach the Bible, they celebrate baptism, they share the Lord's Supper together. Now I wanna go a step further, and I wanna do that by asking you a question. Why do we do all that? All right, why do we gather on Sundays? Why do we gather on Wednesdays? Why do we create other opportunities for the church to, to get together? I guess what I'm asking you is this. Just think for a minute about the purpose of the church. Why does the church exist? And why is it that we do what we do? Well, the Bible gives us three purposes of the church. You're probably thinking of dozens right now. I promise you that anything you're thinking of will fit under one of these three purposes of the church. And if it doesn't, then it's not a purpose of the church. Here, here they are, the purposes of the church. Number one is to worship God. Right? As a church, when we gather together, our call is to worship God. Colossians 3, verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all for the glory of Christ. Ephesians 1, we see that we were the first to hope in Christ so that we might be to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 5 says to be filled with the spirit, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing, make melody to the Lord with your heart. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we sing songs in here, we're not just filling up 20 minutes of our time together, I promise you. When we sing songs in here, it's not just to prepare us for something else, for the opening of the word of God. When we sing songs in here, well, we're worshiping God for the glory of God. Right, that's what he's told us to do. We worship for the overflow of our hearts. We praise God for who he is. We thank God for who he is. We acknowledge that he is above all things and worthy of all the glory, honor, and praise that we could give him. Worship's not just for James and Francis up here. Right, they're not the only ones that are called to worship. That's for the entire church family. Right? And it's for the glory of God. Second purpose of a church is this. It is to build up Believers, Think about that phrase. The church should be building up believers. And when I say church, it's not a building. It's not an abstract organization. If you have trusted in Christ, you are the church. You should be building up other believers. Ephesians 4, listen to this. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints 
it's all of us, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That covers a lot. When we see build up, it means the church should be teaching believers, maturing believers, growing believers spiritually. The church family should be encouraging and loving and supporting for, caring for, meeting the needs of one another. Building up includes spurring one another on towards love, towards Jesus. In Colossians chapter one, Paul says, he toils, he struggles, he invests his life to mature believers in Christ. We looked at the Bible last week, what, what we believe about the Bible. We saw that Jesus has a very high view of scripture. And we should too, because the word of God builds us up. But that's not the only way that we're built up and that believers build one another up. We build one another up through interaction with one another as well, right? Remember, church is people, not bricks. We all play a role in one another's lives. I read this week in the Bible. Just think about this phrase. It's a little wordy, but, but think about what it means. When referring to the early church, the primary activity of the early church was one anothering one another. The primary activity of the church was one anothering one another. 59 times in the New Testament, we see that the church called to build one another up, to one another one another in various ways. Check out the back screen. We put it all together on one. I don't have time to read all of these this morning. When it goes up there, go ahead and, and take a picture of it, but, but you'll see, right? We are called to, to love one another. We're called to pray for one another, invest in one another, bear the burdens of one another, meet the needs of one another. We're called to forgive one another, to offer hospitality to one another. We're called to love one another. Again, love's on there uh, quite a bit. There, there's a bunch. Listen, the, the point is this. We have a responsibility to one another. All right, we're not called to just be acquaintances to say hi and walk in and out on a Sunday morning. We're to be invested in one another, doing all of that for one another. Listen, if we have a steady diet of that, right, if that is what we are feeding one another, we're gonna grow. We're gonna be built up. We're gonna get strong. We need the right things pouring into us to be who God has called and created us to be. All right, think about your body and what, what you need to be built up. All right, think about the food groups. How many are there? Four, five, four. My kids have four. And I asked them, here's their four food groups. Pizza, steak, ice cream, and milkshakes. You're thinking that those last two go together, and I told my kids the same thing. They assured me those are two separate food groups. Pizza, or sorry, uh, ice cream and milkshakes. You gotta have both. And if I fed that to my kids every day, every meal, they would love it for like three days. And then they would be so sick they would not be able to function. They need the right things going into them to make them stronger. They need the right things going into them to develop them physically, to get them fit, to make them prepared for, like, for their bodies to grow and do what their bodies are designed to do. In the same way, what we need, and we need one another in our lives. Or we need one another building each other up. And, and as that happens, man, every single day we're gonna look more and more like Jesus, stronger in our faith, stronger in our relationship with God. We're not gonna be perfect, right? And we'll, we'll never claim to be perfect. I love this quote from Trayvon Wax as he talks about the church building one another up. Listen to what he says. It's true that the church is a hospital for sinners, but the point of a hospital is for the sick to get well. As we build one another up, that's what happens as we invest in one another, as we point one another to the word of God, as we love one another, that hospital for sinners, it begins to function as a school for saints, a place, a gathering of people where believers are built up in their journey to look more and more like Jesus. I hope that you're hearing me say that we have a responsibility to one another. All right, don't forget that. Spiritual life and health is a community project. It is not something we pursue on our own. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting one another. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting one another, as is the habit of some, but let's encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Listen. It's really hard to build up if you don't show up. Your presence in the family of God, it, it matters to your spiritual health, but it matters to the spiritual health of everyone 
around you. We have a responsibility to one another, to provoke one another, not to anger or to frustration, or to provoke or to stir one another up to love, to good deeds, to chasing after Jesus. Listen, make, make gathering with the people of God a priority for you to invest in your spiritual health and the spiritual health of others as well. And then finally, as a church, know that we don't just have a responsibility to one another. We have a responsibility to a bunch of people that aren't here yet. And that's the third purpose of the church. That's to simply share Jesus. He was clear in Matthew 28, go and make disciples. He was clear in Acts 1 when he said, go and be a witness. He was clear in 2 Corinthians 5. He literally says, he tells us, I'm in heaven and I'm staying there, but I've left you on earth as my ambassadors, right? To go tell people about me so they can become a part of the family, children of God, and ultimately be in heaven one day as well. Listen, you're an ambassador in your neighborhood. You're an ambassador in your workplace, in your classroom, among your friend group, your peer group, or whatever. God has sent you as the ambassador there to let people know about him. The purpose of the church is to share Jesus. That's it, right? Worship God, build up believers, and share Christ. That's the biblical church, and it's people, not bricks. And I wanna make one more point as we close this morning. It is biblical for believers to belong to a church. Right? That's the model that we have in Scripture. You can read the New Testament from beginning to end, you can look at every believer that trusts in Christ. You can look at every gathering of people, every local church, and I promise you, you will not find believers going at it alone. They clearly belong to one another. All of these letters in the New Testament that are written to specific churches in specific regions, they are written to specific people that clearly identify as a part of the church, that have clearly invested in one another as members of a local church. Listen, the biblical model isn't individualized and disconnected people that just sort of happen to believe the same thing. This amazing church that we read about in scripture, the marks of it, the purposes of it, all of it, the context is together with one another, right? We're a family called to one another, one another, as we worship God and share Jesus with the world that needs to hear him. Ensure this morning that you belong to a church, that you're in, that you're committed. Don't be anonymous. Don't sneak in and don't sneak out. Get in a life group, find a place to serve, find people that will build you up. Find people that you can build up as you chase after Jesus together. Build those relationships. Listen, do not misunderstand the word church. If you walk around thinking that a church is a building, you're gonna miss out on the amazing gift the church of Jesus is to each and every one of us. Listen, I'm thankful for the church. I love our church family. I'm thankful that it's people, not bricks, and I'm thankful that I get to be a part of this amazing church family with each one of you. Would you bow with me this morning? As we bow our heads, I just want you to think about the church. Think for a minute about the amazing gift that the local church and that the global church is to each and every one of us. Think about the, the reality that we get to be a part of something bigger than us, that God has invited us into the family and that everyone around here, and we're called to build one another up, to invest in one another and ultimately be on mission together. Would you just take a moment where you're sitting and thank God for his church? Do you think about the purposes of the church? You just ask him to move in your heart related to that. Ask him to help you to, to come in here to worship with all that you have, knowing and that your worship is to God himself and that your worship impacts those, those around you as well. Ask him to help you to, to live a life of worship. Ask him just where you're sitting in prayer. Ask him to help you to build others up. You might be thinking this morning, you know what, I'm a little disconnected. I don't know that I've got too many meaningful relationships here. I've been hanging back, I've been slipping in, I've been slipping out. If that's you, I just pray that, that you'd see and know and understand how much you have to offer other people that love Jesus and how much they have to offer you. The biblical model is together, building one another up. 
Sometimes relationships take a little time. Sometimes they take a little work. I'm telling you it's worth it. But if that's you and you'd say, you know what, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm connected enough to build anybody up, take those steps today. Commit to building others up. And then ultimately, just know and understand that we have a responsibility to those that don't know Jesus yet. That as a church, together, as believers, together, we are sent out. This year, the only hope that we have in this life or the next, and that's Jesus Christ. Help us, God, to be your church. And this morning, if you're here, and you'd say, you know what? I heard you, Stephen. You said that, man, all those that have trusted Jesus, and that's who makes up the church, if you'd say this morning you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior and you're ready to do that, do not leave here today without talking to me, one of our pastors, one of our prayer volunteers. We would love to open God's word with you and show you what it looks like to trust in Jesus, to become his child and ultimately a part of the church family. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for who you are. We're grateful for how you love us. And Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that we would have a proper and right and biblical view of your church. God, that we'd see what an incredible blessing it is. And God, I pray that, that we would, would truly be the church to one another. God, that you would continue to knit our hearts together as a family that loves you and that loves one another and that is ready to build each other up and to make an impact on the world around us. God, you are so good to us. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God, to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforest.org connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus, in person, on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.